Well, you know I believe what I taught him. Here I am in Hawaii preaching this morning. No better place to be that I know than to be here uh, uh, in Hawaii. And what a privilege it is to be able to preach to you this morning. My wife and I have concluded about 12 days here on the island of Oahu. And she had a wonderful ladies' day that she conducted last week at the Wawa congregation. I had the privilege of preaching in the gospel meeting there through Wednesday night. We've had several days where she and I were able to enjoy our 27th anniversary celebration. And then uh, today, uh, I've been given this opportunity to preach before we go home uh, tomorrow. And on behalf of all of the guests that are here today, we certainly appreciate your wonderful hospitality. Thank you so much for uh, opening your doors to us this morning as we engage in these worship acts together. I'm thankful for the opportunity that uh, I've had to be with uh, Brother Soli from out at Wyowa and also with uh, Brother Lima. And uh, while I lived in Memphis and uh, worked with the congregation there, it was my privilege to have uh, them as students. And uh, they were outstanding students. They're humble men who love the Lord and they love his word. And uh, I'm so thankful for this week that God has given us to be together. My wife and I now come to you from, from the Chattanooga area. Uh, I preach just south of Chattanooga in Dalton, Georgia. We will return there tomorrow. And I know they, they um, uh, appreciate uh, the work that you're doing because not long ago, Brother Soley was able to visit with us and report on that work to the congregation there and so they're familiar with the work that's going on here on this island and we're praying for you that God's blessings will continue to abound. Well, Paul as he comes to the close of his life will talk about his high regard for scripture. When writing to Timothy he says all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. And those of us who love God, obviously we love his word. And we do not worship the Bible, that's called bibliolatry, but we do worship the author of the Bible, God himself. Psalm 138.2, we read that God has magnified his word above his very name. And therefore we're to take heed to scripture. And realize that we cannot develop our relationship with God or our relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ, if we try and separate our God from His Word. If I'm going to love God at all, I must love what He says. It is expected of you and me as His followers that we listen to what He says and be obedient to Him. And so in the previous hour, I spoke about developing our relationship with God. That ought to be our highest goal here on earth. And that means that we're going to, um, to listen to him. We want to be drawn closer to Jesus. We listen to his words. Jesus stated in Matthew 7, 24, the one who listens to him and abides in his word, that one is a wise man. Furthermore, we would note that, that one who wants to develop a relationship with Christ must be obedient. We know in 1 John 2, 3, that that we are to keep the commandments of our God. If indeed we love him, we'll do that. We want to love like him. John 13, 34, and 35, Jesus said a new commandment, I give unto you that you love one another, even as I have loved you, so love ye one another, verses 34 and 35 of that chapter. And so Jesus says that my people will be known by the way they love and a particular kind of love, a love that would lead him to the cross to die sacrificial death on our behalf. If we want to be followers of Jesus, we understand that we must abide in his truth. Jesus said, John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Jesus stated in John 8, 31 and 32, if you continue my word, you're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And so this morning, we want to understand that as we build a relationship with our Lord, we must saturate our lives daily with Scripture. 
because we cannot disconnect that relationship we have with the Father in heaven or with our Lord Jesus Christ from his word. No doubt about it, David knew God. We read the Psalms and we're impressed how that David had such reverential awe for God and yet he could speak to God as if he was a friend right across the table from him. We would note that David was the shepherd. He was a prophet. He was the king of God's people. He loved God and had a relationship with God, though he never knew God as we know him, that is, through the lens of Christ. And yet, what did David say about his relationship with God, and what did he say about the Word of God? Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in all the Bible, and yet it's a great tribute to the Bible, isn't it? Psalm 119.9, uh, we know that that David would seek to keep himself pure by taking heed thereto according to God's word. In verse 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. So David says, through the word of God there is cleansing. Through the word of God I can remain in a right relationship with him. And so when we go back to that passage in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, we learn how that God has told us what is right. He's told us what is wrong. We learn how to get right when we've done wrong, and we learn how to stay right, all by taking heed to, to his holy word. I want you today to have as your number one goal in life, nurturing and growing and developing your relationship with God, but that comes through your proper understanding of the Holy Scriptures. Did you know that it is a blessing just to read the Word of God? Revelation 1-3, blessed is he that readeth. A lot of times at the beginning of a year, we will pass along to members a uh, Bible reading chart. And people will make up their minds at the first of the year, make a New Year's resolution. I'm going to read the Bible through this year. That's good, isn't it? To take a moment every day to read a few chapters in the Old Testament, a few chapters of the New Testament, that one might read through the Bible in an entire year. But not only must we be readers of the Bible, we must study. And there is a difference. 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing or handling aright the word of truth. But you know one could study the word of God and have a great knowledge of the word and still not really be developing the relationship that he has with God. There still comes that moment when he must seek a higher level of understanding, a, 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 a deeper knowledge of God's word. So what does he do? He meditates on it. He's not interested in just reading or studying, but listen to the psalmist. Thy word have I meditated day and night. To meditate upon means to ponder it, doesn't it? To listen intently to what God is saying through his word. To think about it regularly. To apply it to your life. And so one can read it and be blessed. One can study it and have a good understanding. But as one meditates upon Holy Scripture, he says in his own heart and in his mind, I am wanting the word of God to transform me, to change me, that I might be more after the image of God. When we go to the Holy Scriptures and we humble ourselves at the teachings of our Lord, we are allowing God's Word to convict us, but not only to convict us, but to correct us, and not only to correct us, but to change us and help us to know Him better. Now, when one speaks of meditating upon the Word of God, what is meant by that? Well, meditating does not mean that we always have a Bible in our hand necessarily. But it does mean that we are becoming so familiar with the kernels of truth contained therein that we are allowing that word to, to stay on our minds and dwell in our hearts so that the word of God will influence what we do. We know that we want Christ to be seen in us. How does that happen? It happens as we conform our lives to his truth. And so I would suggest to you this morning, dear Christian friends, if you've been reading the Bible, that's good, but may you dedicate yourself to more study. And if you've been studying the word of God, then, then meditate upon it. 
ponder what you're studying. Think about it regularly and apply it. But when you and I approach the Bible, it is important that, that we ask ourselves what I would call three broad questions as we study the divine text. First of all, we might ask this. What did the passage I'm studying or the particular book of the Bible I'm studying mean to those to whom it was originally written. It's very helpful, for example, when one uh, considers 1 John to know something about the, the Gnostic movement of the first century, which denied that deity could inhabit flesh. But to deny that deity could inhabit flesh would mean that we would deny that Jesus came in the flesh. For he was 100% God and 100% man. He was God incarnate. So John is writing from that particular vantage point to help his readers understand that indeed Jesus Christ did come in the flesh. But we might ask ourselves another question. And that is, what does this particular passage or this chapter or this book of the Bible mean for all time? What are the eternal principles that I can gain therein? And then finally, what does it mean to me personally is what each one of us needs to ask. This passage that I'm studying, that I'm meditating upon, what does it mean to me personally? I was one of those who was very blessed to have a mother who read to me when I was a child. And she read to me from the Holy Scriptures. And so I became very well acquainted at a, at a young age with the various uh, narratives that one finds in the Old Testament. I became very familiar with the, with the parables of Jesus and uh, with the missionary journeys of Paul. And I'm so thankful that I learned both at home and in the congregation where we attended to love and respect and appreciate the Bible. I can recall my mother uh, reading to my brother and me about Noah and the ark that he built. And uh, she would go through the account of Noah. And she would talk about how he built that ark according to the specifications that God gave him. But then she would always make a spiritual application that we could understand. She would help us to understand that just as Noah had to be on that ark to be saved, there's an ark of safety for us today. And that ark of safety today is found in Christ and in his church. And that helped me to make the proper application to what it was that I was learning. So when we study and meditate upon Holy Scripture, ask yourself, what did it mean to those who originally heard this message? What are the eternal principles that I can learn that are for all people of all time? And then what does this mean to me personally? Now, those are three broad questions that I think are good to ask when studying and meditating upon Holy Scripture. But here are six basic questions that I think all of us should ask ourselves as we study and meditate upon the Bible. First of all, consider this. Is there some particular sin for me to avoid when I am looking at certain passages of the Scripture? Christianity, for some, obviously, is about what you can't do and uh, what you don't do. And while it is true that Christianity is more than that, it is important that we realize that, that there is behavior that is approved in the Holy Scriptures and there is behavior uh, that is condemned. We read the passage in Psalm 1.1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, nor standeth in the way of sinners. But what? He, he meditates upon the law of the Lord, so he does not... Um, he does not walk in a certain path. He does not stand in a particular place. He doesn't sit in a particular place. Why? Because he is God's child. He uh, wants to develop um, uh, behavior that is in accordance with what he's learned from God. So we might ask ourselves this question when studying the Holy Scriptures. Is there some particular sin I ought to avoid as a Christian? But likewise, is there some promise for me to claim? in a particular passage that I'm studying. Those of us who are New Testament Christians can readily recite Acts 2.38, and well, we should. Because on the day of Pentecost, we recall that, that Peter convicted those gathered 
of their sin of crucifying Jesus. And they cried out, men and brethren, what must we do? Well, Peter said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now think about that just for a moment. There is a promise that is made in that particular chapter and in that verse. The promise is this, the remission of sins. That's good news, isn't it? Every one of us should desire to have our sins forgiven. And there Peter makes a promise that our sins indeed can be forgiven. And so he says that is conditioned upon one's repentance and baptism. And so repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, that you might receive the promise. And the promise is remission of sins. So it is when you study the Holy Scriptures and when you meditate upon God's Word, think not only about some sin that you might ought to avoid, but also consider, is there a promise for me to claim? Then you might ask this question, is there a victory for me to gain? You know, in Romans chapter 12, I believe God tells us something very, very important about how we maintain proper relationships. Obviously, a key theme in the Bible is reconciliation. First of all, it is reconciliation with God. And likewise, we know that if it is at all possible, we're to live at peace with all men. And so we ought always to seek reconciliation with others in accordance with what God's word teaches us. And so uh, in, in Romans chapter 12, God tells us how to deal with interpersonal relationships, especially when we feel we have been wronged. In verse 18 of Romans 12, uh, Paul writes, If it is possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. But sometimes we recognize it's not possible to live peaceably with others. What do we do about that? Particularly, what do you and I do when we believe we have been wronged by somebody else? Well, we're tempted to take that matter into our own hands, aren't we? We want to be able to seek revenge. We want to be able to get back at somebody worse than what they got us, really. But notice what admonition we receive from Paul. Paul says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. He says, It is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, we know that's true because Paul was writing by divine inspiration. We know that's God's word, but that's hard to put into practice, isn't it? It's hard to put into practice when we feel we've been wronged by somebody, maybe even a brother, sister in Christ, and we want to exact revenge. But notice the Lord says, let him do that. He says, let me take care of that. Why should he take care of that instead of you and me? Because he is the one who knows how to deal with those situations better than we do. He says, don't you try to seek vengeance on somebody else. You live above that. The victory is yours when you do that. I'll take care of, of what has happened in your life that, that uh, uh, may be uh, wrong, uh, where you were mistreated, whatever it may be, you take the higher ground. And so when I study a passage like that, it helps me to understand he's looking out for me. He wants what is best for me. He's looking out for my good. I need to leave such matters to him. And when I do, when you do, we gain the victory. But I might also ask this, is there a blessing to enjoy? When I study a particular passage, such as Psalm 37, I see the blessings that are found in following the Word of God. Remember, all spiritual blessings are found in Christ. And in Psalm 37, I, I learn uh, how to receive great blessings when I'm trusting in my Father in heaven. There are four particular words that stand out in the opening eight verses of Psalm 37 that you might want to underscore that have been very helpful for me. For example, in Psalm 37, underscore the word in verse 3, trust. Notice in verse 4, the word delight. In verse 5, notice that word commit. And in verse 7, notice the word rest. This is a great psalm that will bless you if you study it and meditate upon it. Notice the blessings that are involved in trusting in the Lord. Trust in the Lord and do good. Now notice, so shalt thou dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be uh, fed 
Great blessing comes to those who trust in the Lord. Look at verse 4. He says, delight yourself. Why? Why delight yourself in the Lord? Because he says he will give you the desires of your heart. There's a great blessing in delighting in him. Verse 5, commit your way to the Lord. Why? There's a great blessing when I commit my way to the Lord. Trust also in him. He will bring it to pass. That is the desires of your heart. What is best for you? He will grant it. And then rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. When I rest in the Lord, that means I'm content in him. And there's a great blessing. I can learn how to steadfastly endure whatever comes. So when we study the Holy Scriptures and we meditate thereon, we find that that there may be some sin here for us to avoid. Likewise, there there likewise is a promise that we can claim. If we keep studying, we will notice there's a blessing to enjoy and a victory to gain. But we might ask ourselves also another question. When we study and meditate upon Scripture, is there some truth about God we've never seen before? Someone has said that that the, the word of God is like the ocean. Little children can play around the shoreline. And likewise, those who are older and more mature can step out where it's deeper. And so it is that little children love to hear the stories and the narratives that come from the word of God. But those of us who have been Christians longer, we can delve deeper into the word of God. And every time I study, perhaps you've noticed this as well, it seems that I learn something new that is beneficial to me spiritually. And so, is there some truth about God we've never seen before? Consider that when you're studying a particular passage. And then number six, how does this particular passage draw me closer to Jesus? How does this particular scripture help me to look more like him? And so, as you read, learn how to study. And as you study, learn how to meditate, concentrate on the Gospels regularly because you can't know Jesus if you don't know anything about Jesus. It is very, very important that you and I understand God's plan of salvation. We need to know the organization of the church. We need to be able to uh, uh, talk about uh, 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 eschatological matters. Uh, Jesus is coming again. We understand that. We look forward to that. We, we want to go to heaven. We want to avoid hell. We understand all of those doctrinal vantage points. But if we don't know Jesus, we've missed it all, haven't we? We want to grow and develop that relationship with him. And so as we come to know him better, we might ask ourselves this question. How can I convert more people to him? Then I go to the book of Acts. After having studied all about Jesus in the gospel records, I then go to the book of Acts and learn how I can convert people to him. How can I have a greater appreciation for the church that belongs to Jesus? I go to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is a book of six chapters dedicated to the teaching about the church of our Lord. How can I have the the joy of Christ and the peace that passes understanding? Then go to the book of Philippians and you will see. How can I live more pleasing to Christ? Go to the practical book of James and you'll find out how you can live a life that is pleasing to Christ. It's It's a book of practical Christianity. Somebody might ask, how can I have the comfort of Christ? Then go to the Psalms and study and meditate upon the prayers that uh, David, for example, often offered unto God. How can I have the wisdom of Christ, someone might ask. Go to the book of Proverbs, which are filled with eternal principles for daily living. Somebody says, how can I have a more forgiving spirit, one likened to Christ? Read 1 John, and you'll come away with a more forgiving spirit. And so what I'm saying is this, dear friends, If you look for our Lord Jesus Christ, when you study and meditate upon the Holy Scriptures, you will find him. And you will find him in every book, in every chapter, on every page in the Bible. He is the hero 
of this divinely inspired book. He is the one who was sent from heaven to save our souls. And as mentioned during the Bible class this morning, the greatest priority in our lives ought to be the same as that of the Apostle Paul, who stated in Philippians 3.10 more than anything else, he wanted to know him. And you and I can know him. We can know him as we saturate our daily lives with his word. And tonight we're going to learn something else that's very, very important to that relationship. As God communicates to us through his word, we communicate with him through prayer. And so we want to be regularly engaging in purposeful prayer as we keep that open line of communication with our Heavenly Father. Do you know Jesus this morning? If not, I want to encourage you to listen attentively to what His Word says. Because through the Holy Scriptures, you can learn what to do to be saved. This morning, a penitent believer can confess the sweet name of Jesus be baptized for the remission of your sins. When you do that, you will be added to the church of our Lord. You will be found in Christ where salvation is found, 2 Timothy 2.10. The blood of Jesus will cleanse you from every sin stain. And you can leave here this morning in a right relationship with God, and you can begin to build on that relationship. God loves you. He wants you to be saved. Jesus' death on the cross is evident of that fact. And those of us who are here this morning who are Christians, who have come to God through Christ, we want you to be saved as well. If I'm speaking to someone this morning who is a child of God, has wandered away from his Lord, why not come home? The door is always open. The parable of the prodigal son certainly teaches us that God is always ready to welcome his erring children back home. He stands waiting for you. And through repentance and prayer, you can once again be restored not only to a proper relationship with the Father in heaven, but also with your brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray this morning that you will heed the gospel invitation, remember the words that have been spoken, and come as together we stand and sing.